Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the Chorosphere Pavilion. Um, I welcome you to this event, which is about the importance of snow um, in Scotland and Chorosphere, and snow in Scotland and Chorosphere also in the US. Um, I am a PhD at the Fry University of Amsterdam, um, and we will first have um, Grant Moore talking, he's uh, chief executive from the Gen Gore National Park, uh, to talking to us about the cryosphere in Scotland. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, lovely to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about the Cairngorms National Park um, and snow and some of the work that we've been doing within the Cairngorms on that and climate. Um, and uh, welcome to Scotland, I should say, as well, of course. Um, just in case you don't know where the Cairngorms is, Cairngorms is the largest national park in the UK. It's four and a half thousand square kilometres um, and it is in, in the north of Scotland. Um, the Cairngorms has got a large mountain massif um, in the central part of it. Um, it's home to 18,000 people um, and we get about 2.1 million visitors each year as well. It's also home to 25% of the UK's rare and endangered species. Um, and it's also got four uh, large headwaters or rivers within it, um, and has four of the five um, highest mountains in Scotland within it as well. This gives you an idea of what the, the central core looks like, um, subarctic, um, not a lot of soil, um, and that's looking down the Larry Grew towards the Devil's Point. And then this is uh, Glen Feshy, and this is some of our larger semi-natural ecosystems that we, we have in Scotland um, there. And this is looking at the Northern Corries, um, which is one of the key um, ice climbing areas in Scotland. Um, and just uh, next to that is Cairngorm Mountain, which is one of three ski resorts in the Cairngorms as well, along with Glenshee um, and, and the Lecht. And then finally, as you come further down, this is Inch Marshes. Um, this is one of the largest um, inland freshwater uh, marshes in uh, Scotland is about a thousand hectares as well. So you see the sort of the type and scale of of, of the national park um, that I'm lucky enough to work in. Um, we did um, some work with the James Hutton Institute um, uh, about a couple of years ago, and also with Climate Exchange, looking at snow cover um, and the Cairngorms National Park. Um, it's a really key thing for us. It obviously impacts on a lot of things within the park, whether that be tourism, whether that be nature. Um, and we want to know a bit more about what will be happening looking at some of the um, uh, scenario planning uh, for the future. And that was done uh, and we published that um, about 18 months ago. This is um, temperature um, from the meteorological station at Balmoral from 1928 to 2018. Um, and it's looking at maximum temperatures and minimum temperatures um, throughout the, the main winter period in Scotland. Obviously, what you can see is the clear trend is that the maximum temperature is increasing and the minimum temperature is increasing across that time. Um, and it's a long, long uh, set of figures um, for Balmoral as well. The next one is snow days at the Cairngorm chairlift um, on Cairngorm Mountain. And that's looking at the number of days above 2, 5, 10, 15 and 20 centimetre depths um, at that location. And as you can see, there's lots of variations across that over time, but also you can see that the, the trend is obviously down in terms of um, snow cover within the Cairngorms National Park. Now, the next few slides are looking at some of the scenarios in terms of uh, out to 2018 using UKCP 18 climate change projections. And basically what these show is that between now and 2030, um, snow cover in the Cairngorms will be similar to what it is just now. So that is, we get quite a lot of variation um, and we get some years that have large snow dumps and other years where we get very little snow at all. And that will stay roughly similar between now and 2030. It's then showing that from 2030 to 2040, you start to get a decline in snow cover within the Cairngorms National Park. And then from 2040 to 2050, you start to see significant snow uh, reductions within the Cairngorms National Park. And then obviously from 2050 to 2080, um, we start to get significant snow cover um, reductions at all levels within the Cairngorms. So this is looking at both um, 600 to 800 metres um, and over 800 metres as well. So it's seeing that basically across the park, we will have um, 
not very much snow by 2080 on these scenario plannings. And the reason that this is um, Garv Corrie Moor and Brea Reich, this is the third highest mountain in Scotland. Um, and it's Scotland's, uh, one of Scotland's only sort of semi-permanent um, uh, patches of snow. Um, and it's melted on the following year since the 1700s. So 1933, 1959, 1996, 2003, 2006, 2017, 2018, and 2021. Um, so that's eight times, but six of those have been in the last 18 years and three in the last five years. And completely melting in consecutive years in 2017 and 2018 uh, was unprecedented. So we're seeing these impacts already happening in the Cairngorms. Um, uh, and there's a picture of a man behind the snow having a look at it. So we've got lots of impacts happening in the park already. Um, and we also have um, scenarios showing that that's going to continue and get worse um, as we go forward. And the reason that that's um, important is it affects many different things. So this is some other work that uh, James Hutton Institute has been looking at, which is looking at um, impacts on private water supplies in Scotland um, around, again, some of those um, climate change predictions uh, for the period 2020 to 2050. And this, um, what it can basically show you is that the northeast of Scotland has got some particular issues around private water supplies and the lack of water on the east side of Scotland and that obviously links back to some of the work uh, in terms of the Cairngorms and snow cover and snow melt and such like. There's also significant impacts on species within the National Park. Um, and this is already being shown. So things like uh, golden plover. Um, so there's changes to chick food supply um, and them coming at different times of year um, from, from what was previously there. And so there's uh, impacts on plover populations. Um, there's impacts on Capercaillie. We're at the edge of the Capercaillie range in terms of um, Europe and, and Asia. Um, and with springs becoming wetter, um, there's an impact on chick mortality. Um, and that, that's one of the issues around uh, why we're having problems with uh, mortality rates around uh, Capercaillie and young Capercaillie. Um, and then there's impacts on things like dotterel, um, snow bunting, and potentially ptarmigan as well, as we look uh, to the future as well. Also up there um, is a picture of salmon, um, and in temperatures um, of over 23 degrees in rivers, salmon suffer from thermal stress, resulting in reduction in egg size and growth. Um, and in recent years, in some of the upper tributaries in the River Dee, temperatures of 27 degrees have been recorded. And this is the impacts we're starting to see already coming through, and that obviously impacts not just in terms of nature, but it also impacts in terms of the salmon uh, fishing industry and the jobs surrounding that as well within, within Scotland. And then finally, freshwater pearl mussels. Um, the National Park's incredibly uh, important for freshwater pearl mussels, both on the D and the Spey. And uh, low flows can have a devastating impact um, on freshwater pearl mussels. Um, and we had that in 2018 when a lot of um, mussel beds were left high and dry. But similarly, an increase in spate conditions and really fast flowing events can wash out mussels as well. And we had that in the D side of things in 2016 when we had a major flood event on the D side of things and many mussel mussels were lost from known locations as well. So we're getting these extreme events happening more and they're impacting on, on the nature of the park as well as, uh, if you like, um, many of the other things that are happening in the national park around people um, as well. So what is happening in the Cairngorms National Park? What are we looking to do? So this is some of the work that we're doing to try and help to um, mitigate um, uh, climate uh, impacts and also to um, adapt climate impacts. So this is peatland restoration um, in the Cairngorms. There's about 90,000 hectares of degraded peatland in the Cairngorms, um, and that's a significant amount of peatland. Um, we've got um, a significant amount of work happening to make sure that um, we start to restore that. We're doing about 500 hectares of peatland restoration a year at the moment, but we've got to increase that significantly. And we're looking, we've got a target to restore 35,000 hectares um, by 2045 as a minimum. Um, and that work is underway, both using public funding and also bringing in private finance as well around that. Um, this is a picture of some work that we did on uh, at Linda Breck um, with Wildland Limited as part of the Cairngorms Connect side of things. And Cairngorms Connect is the biggest um, eco ecological restoration project in the UK. Uh, it's within the Cairngorms. It covers about 60,000 hectares within the Cairngorms. 
and this is some peatland restoration. That was before the work was done. And then that's the picture from um, this past uh, 2021 in terms of the peatland uh, restoration work once that's that's happened on that area. So there's significant work going on with the Cairngorms. Um, it can be potentially very good for climate, but it's also very good in terms of looking to the future in terms of green jobs, where we can get employment and actually make sure we can deliver on, on the, the 2045 net zero target that, that Scotland has. In terms of woodland, Cairngorms woodland covers about 16.8%, which is below the Scottish average, but it's also below, well below the European average. Um, again, we've got a draft target, which is looking at um, increasing woodland cover in the Cairngorms by about 35,000 hectares uh, by 2045. Um, and at the moment, we're doing about 1,000 hectares of woodland expansion um, each year within the Cairngorms. Some of that through natural regeneration and deer reductions, some of that through planting as well within the Cairngorms. But that, if we do that work, it would bring our woodland cover up to 23%, roughly speaking, of the National Park as woodland cover. And a lot of that is native woodland as well. Um, there's still more work to be done on that. And um, it's, it certainly is uh, an interesting area in terms of trying to get the balance right between woodland expansion, peatland restoration, farming, and all the other things that, that happen within, within the Cairngorms. I'll give you an, just an example of some of the, the natural regeneration that's happening around some of the old growth Caledonian pines within the Cairngorms as well. And then we're doing a lot of work um, around river restoration as well within the Cairngorms. And this is really about trying to slow the flow, trying to make sure that we've got more renaturalized river systems in the Cairngorms and trying to make sure that, um, if you like, how, how, we, how we take forward work on our rivers looks at how, first of all, they can be used to hold the waters back before they head downstream and some of the issues we've had around flooding in, in different parts. Um, of Scotland as well. So that's a key thing for us. And again, we're looking at trying to renaturalize about 75% um, of the river systems within the Cairngorms over the next 25 years as well. So we've got some big ambitious plans around that to try and take that forward. And all that work's underpinned by carbon audit work that we're doing across the whole of the National Park Network within the UK. So the Cairngorms has undertaken a carbon audit, which we'll be publishing in the next month or two, which we'll look at exactly how much emissions are coming, not just from residents, but of visitors coming to the park as well. And then what are the key things we've got to do to start to reduce emissions, which is mainly around energy, transport, housing, all that side of things, as well as the land use side of things. And that's the, the, the different things we've, we've got to do across those uh, things to try and meet that 2045 net zero side of things. And at the moment we have um, the Cairngorms uh, National Park plan out for consultation. And that's really our plan that says, how are we going to meet that 2045 commitments that the Scottish Government have? And how are we going to try and make sure that we do the things we need to do on both mitigating climate change um, and adapting climate change? Uh, to my mind, the Cairngorms should be a place, an example of how you do these things, how you involve people. And I think this is one of the key things for me. I suppose it's quite different to maybe how uh, national parks and other places in the world, but obviously we have 18,000 residents within the park. We've got to take those people with us. Actually, they're, they're part of the solution to all of this. Um, we've got to take things like the skiing industry with us. We've got to try and make sure the land management and, and that side's all, all being done as well. So it's crucial for us that we take all those things, but we're also ambitious in how we do that um, and that ultimately we deliver on our part and hopefully everyone else delivers on their part as we all head towards trying to keep to the, the 1.5 target. So that was all I was wanting to say today. Thank you very much for your time um, and happy to take any questions on this. I think after Pam does the next um, presentation, um, and uh, then we'll, we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, this is a presentation I put together just prior to uh, this event, and it was to try to give a little bit of hope, but also uh, a, a bit of a connection to the recreation industry, which really is a major industry. And you know, we're talking about extreme levels of sea level rise, loss of water resources and so on. But for a lot of countries, uh, this is a major economic impact. You'll be hearing from Switzerland later today. Um, and I wanted to give both a vision and a caution in terms of how far this can go. So 
as you've heard before, you know, mountains and snow provide water and snowpack is something that actually is sometimes neglected. It's easier to project glaciers. It's easier to figure out what's going on with glaciers. But in terms of water resources, one of the things I actually learned very early on from uh, Dr. Georg Kaiser, who's sitting right there, is that you really can't forget snowpack. Uh, in many ways, it's much more important, but it's much harder for scientists to quantify. But again, it, it provides many benefits. Uh, you know, drinking water, sanitation cannot be forgotten, energy. Um, and there are certainly very vulnerable regions to this extent, but on a seasonal basis, these sources can be extremely important. And probably the most prominent example right now, at least in the media, is what's going on in the western U.S. There are drought conditions, and that's really the prime driver, but uh, lack of snowpack over the past several years of drought has certainly contributed to that situation, because that's really been a huge source of uh, the rivers that feed the western U.S. Um, and so you get a lot of... Uh, hazards uh, with this sort of wet or snow, for example, that's follow, uh, falling, you can get a lot more uh, greater risks of avalanches. That's been seen, including in recreational areas. Um, and lack of snow really impacts local economies, uh, including here in Scotland. And, you know, finally, and, and this also should not be forgotten, for a lot of, of regions that we're talking about right now, the presence of glaciers, the presence of snow, it's part of the culture. Uh, it, it really is part of the identity of a lot of peoples who live in these areas. And uh, I really, you know, there, there's not much snow, if any, right now, Grant. I don't know if there, there's any at high elevations yet at this point. A little bit, Yeah. Uh, I actually got a bit outside of Glasgow. I would encourage those of you who can to get out. It's just an incredibly beautiful nature here. So I really enjoyed that presentation. Uh, so now I'm going to drill down uh, and focus just a little bit more on what lack of snow means. And then ICCI, um, the organization uh, that is organizing this pavilion, it exists in Sweden, it also exists in Vermont, and so talking a bit about the experience there. So um, we know that it's changing in the world's mountains. We know that snow cover is changing. Uh, it is arriving later in the year. It melts earlier in the year. It's more sporadic. Uh, there are a number of times where those of us who live in these regions know that this snow, or the rain that is falling really should be snow. Uh, but it isn't, given the time of year, because the temperature is just too warm. And in the UK and in Scotland, those impacts range from water supply to fire incidents, which is something we can't neglect if you're getting drought conditions. Or if you're, you know, when you have the snow on the ground, it sort of mediates the, the precipitation that normally occurs throughout the year. If it's falling as rain, the earth can dry out much more quickly if there comes a drought you know, period, and then you can get a higher incidence of fire. And again, recreation. Uh, this gives a sense in the northern hemisphere of the decrease in snow extent. Uh, this is beginning in 1967 to 2010. Some of the records go back even further, but a clear downward trend. And uh, now I'm getting a little bit more practical. I'm an ex-diplomat. Part of my career was in Oslo and certainly in uh, Normarka, which is just north of Oslo. People are really noticing some years an incredible lack of snow, that there's no snow at times that there always was before. For World Cup events and so on that take place uh, in Normarka, north of Oslo, Holmenkollen, where the Olympics took place, uh, they're having to track in snow truck in snow to make sure that there's going to be enough. They actually start stockpiling it months ahead of time just to make sure that when the event takes place, they're going to be able to host it. So here again, you know, it's up and down. It's, it's very variable from year to year. Nevertheless, a very clear downwards trend. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the solutions. The resolutions uh, on some of these pictures is not that great, but this is from the Bolton Valley Ski Resort, which many, many years ago decided to try and make its snowmaking operations more sustainable. As you get more rain, less snow, 
what the the downhill ski industry needs to start doing and they recognize this very early is make that snow when it's cold make as much as you can so that it's there and so it can survive the really you know bad periods there there were some periods in past years where this particular resort needed to close during periods that it was never closed before because of lack of snow it's a major employer in the area. Uh, it brings a lot of people to the Burlington, Vermont area, serves a lot of local places. Uh, my own son sort of learned to ski there. They open up for very cheap amounts on you know different days of the week. The schools in the region will take their students there when they're in third, fourth, fifth grade to sort of get them into the sport. So it's a really, really broad part of the culture in that part of Vermont. So uh, they put up this wind turbine so that when they're making snow, they're not contributing to the problem. And so they've been carbon neutral for some time. This is a little bit more unusual. The Nordic ski industry, which for a long time was almost opposed to anything other than natural snow. But here again, after a few really difficult years, uh, I would say that maybe two thirds of the Nordic ski areas are now making snow. In some cases, they only have enough to cover a little bit of the tracks. Uh, and this is from what was my local ski area, Sleepy Hollow. Uh, and they basically started with an, what they called an out and back. It was literally maybe 250 meters, you know, a quarter of a kilometer, one snow gun, making snow so that you could at least go out and back for the high school teams that would come and practice. And then over the years, they've kind of expanded that snowmaking. And now I think the snowmaking loop covers maybe three to five kilometers. So they can guarantee snow as long as it's cold enough to uh, be able to, you know, support themselves and make it go forward. And what's nifty about this is that it's driven entirely by solar power. They have about 100 kilowatts now. Uh, they've been installing it over the years. This is David and Sandy Enman who bought Sleepy Hollow and began installing solar first on their houses. And now they have different kinds of solar. They have trackers, they, you know, which, which sort of track the sun. That's a very Vermont, I think, sort of thing. There's a company that makes them, but they shift with the sun to sort of maximize the amount of power you can get from solar panels. They have them on their house. They have them on all of the houses that are, are part of that area. So at this point in time, you know, depending on how much snow they have to make, but so far it looks like they're going to be cover, able to cover all of their energy needs, including snow making in the winter. And that's huge because one of the difficulties, and I think that a lot of it, it is a big debate in, in Vermont, uh, is that it is a very energy intensive enterprise and water intensive enterprise to be making snow. And so they're trying to do it in as sustainable as way possible. At both places I've shown you, they have fairly deep ponds. They, you know, so it's on site. They're not taking water from other uses. And so that's, that's an important aspect. But I will say also that a reality, certainly for the state of Vermont, is that there's only so much mitigation you can do before it becomes impossible. Uh, Sleepy Hollow in the fall is a place that makes its own maple syrup. Uh, that's a major industry again in the state. And the IPCC projections make it quite clear that the Vermont maple syrup industry, if we follow a high emission scenario, will no longer be possible. Uh, maples cannot survive. They need a really cold, and in particular, they need a, a period of uh, deep freeze, really. And then you need a period where you have freezing temperatures at night and just above freezing temperatures during the day to make the sap run. That particular environment will no longer exist. The maples themselves will no longer be able to exist, and it will be a Canadian maple industry because there simply won't be the, the maple trees south of the border in the U.S. to support that. So then it's important to talk about mitigation. And I think it's you know, always important to end with, with these messages. We really do need to hold temperatures below 1.5 degrees. That requires 50% reductions in CO2 over the next 10 years in all sectors uh, and among all countries and stakeholders. And what this looks like in this graph is that we have this very steep decline in this next decade. 
coming to net zero in 2050. And then we actually need negative emissions in the rest of the century. And the amount of negative emissions, which is very questionable in some ways, is really going to be, be dependent on how much CO2 we emit over especially the next decade uh, and how much more needs to be pulled out of the atmosphere through negative emissions technologies. So um, these changes are feasible. It's an important message. The IPCC in its special report on 1.5 degrees made clear it's physically possible. It's environmentally feasible. We have the technology. It's economically advantageous and the rest is going to be up to us. And so that's what we're about here at COP26. And uh, with that, I just draw your attention to the State of the Cryosphere report, which was released just before COP26 with more detail on all of these dynamics, including glaciers and snow. And uh, I'd like to turn it over now for sort of commentary as both a youth and a recreation person, Lauren McCallum, again from here in Scotland, uh, Protect Our Winters, or POW, which is an international organization of uh, athletes, I would say, who are uh, people who want to preserve our winters. That's what it stands for, protect our winters. So Lauren, please. Oh, thank you so much, Pam. It's a uh, delight to be here and that, welcome to Scotland as well. Just. Uh, it's not every day that you have the world's climate community come to your doorstep. So it's, a, it's an honor uh, to be here with you all. Um, but also, I guess, to give a, a bit of a human perspective around the stories that we heard from Grant and also Pam. My name is Lauren McCallum and I'm the general manager of Protect Our Winters UK. And we're a climate action charity that works with the outdoor industry and community. And we help passionate outdoor people become effective climate advocates so we can achieve systemic solutions to climate change. And that's really important because we understand that um, as much as personal lifestyle choices are um, help us get on the journey and they'll deliver some change, we need to use that connection to the snow, use that connection to the outdoors and really push for the systemic changes that are going to give us the big carbon reductions that we need to see to keep us to 1.5 degrees. Um, and we've done this at the minute through, uh, we've, well, we've got various campaigns running, but uh, one of our biggest campaigns we've got running is Divest the Dirt around trying to engage the outdoor community to, uh, to put pressure on their, on their pension providers, but also around North Sea oil and gas um, and trying to get a, a, a commitment to an end date around that extraction and what that means for Scotland and the just transition. But I guess really I'm here as I live in Abbeymore. I'm one of the 18,000 residents that that um, that Grant talked about, and I wanted to kind of give a bit of a perspective uh, on on the ground. Cairngorm is 1,245 meters tall, which uh, I guess to some of our European or North American mountains is 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 fairly um, is fairly small. Um, but as we've heard, we've heard this week that, and we've seen in Grant's presentation that. Um, resorts below 2,000 meters are going to struggle to see that consistent snowfall. So what does that mean for us? And we, we've seen the, the impacts, again, through Grant's presentation around the, around the um, sort of biodiversity. Um, but what does that mean for the people? What does that mean for my local community? You know, it's easy to sort of talk about um, the, the loss of snow, but I, th I feel that with the loss of that also means the loss of, of my community. Scotland has a rich history of snow sports um, and some of the most pioneering, pioneering minds that came to Scotland uh, after World War II came to learn to how to set up the ski industries and then went, then went to Europe. So we have a sort of deep cultural history of, of skiing and snowboarding uh, and the snow sports industry. Um, and I feel like that intergenerational knowledge is really at threat because if we can't connect to the cryosphere, if we can't connect to snow, if we can't have those deep, meaningful life experiences within nature, the, the, the powder days or the days that are, uh, you know, bleak and I don't know, you get lost or something happens, but you know, you get through it and you go to the pub afterwards, and you have a couple of beers and it's, it's all right. Those experiences in life, 
are so important to connect us to, to the issues. So if we lose snow and we lose that connection, then how can we ever know why it's important or, or why we need to protect it? So I guess that's our, um, that's our mission and vision at Protect Our Winters UK is to use that so that we can lobby for, for more progressive change. In Scotland, uh, just a bit of a snapshot, there's over 600 jobs uh, that the ski industry employs directly, uh, and it contributes over to, to 30, 30 million. That's not the wider recreation, recreational industry, that's just skiing. Um, and I'm a daughter of North Sea oil and gas workers. I grew up in the Northeast, um, and both my parents work for um, some pretty well-known oil and gas companies. And so when we talk about the just transition, we think about, you know, the sort of more traditional um, saving North Sea oil and gas jobs, for example. But I guess what I would like to talk about more is where is the just transition for the rural economy when we lose snow, when we lose that community? Because it's going to have the same impacts just as, as, uh, as a more traditional industry that gets up and leaves after it shuts its doors. So I, uh, I guess I'm trying to bump that up the, the agenda to sort of everyone to keep that in mind and I guess some solidarity. Um, I guess I just wanted to close by saying I'm a great believer that the Cairngorms has shaped who I am today. It's a very unique landscape. It's more of an Arctic uh, landscape than it, is a, than it is an Alpine. And I guess there's a, well, um, I've just totally forgotten her name. Anyways, the phrase is, we go out to go in. Um, and Nan Shepherd, sorry, very famous naturalist who, who wrote a book called The Living Mountain. And she says in that, you have to go out to go in. And if we can't go out, then how can we go in? And I feel the answers with us, within us, lie within that retrospective of, of going outside and coming back inside to evaluate and to make those changes. So. Um, I just, I guess, wanted to finish with that, that because if we lose that opportunity to go out and we can't have the evaluation to go in, then we will never be able to make the progressive changes that we want to see. So um, I'll be here for some questions and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we will have a moment of question and answers. Uh, so you're welcome to ask your questions to this uh, microphone here and online as well. You're more than welcome to ask your questions. And uh, we have our three great speakers here that will answer your questions. Thank you very much. Yep. Data center. Uh, just NSIDC, uh, you can Google or you can look at that. We have something called Snow Today. And uh, that is a site where you can actually track what's going on in terms of Western U.S. snowpack from satellite data, uh, from Snowtel, uh, things like that. So it's a great resource for uh, monitoring what happens. But I've got a pointed question here. You know, you talk about, you know, cutting emissions down 50 percent by 2030, right? And what are you going to do? You know, I fly over at Chicago at night and I look down at the lights and I say, my God, the scale of this issue is immense, right? So what do you do? I mean, if you talk to Jim Hansen and I agree with him, the only way forward is full bore nuclear. You know, how else are you going to do this? I'm going to ask that question. Uh, well... That's an interesting question, <laughs> rather bigger than I suppose my uh, my um, ability to answer it in total. I suppose, I mean, I look after an area like a national park, um, and I suppose what we've got to do there is do absolutely everything we can in our place to do the things that will make the biggest difference. Um, so I was talking previously about transport. So that you know, at the moment, it's something like ninety-five percent of people who come to the Cairngorms come by car. Um, how are we going to change that? When they come to the caring arms and they move around the caring arms, how do they do that? So we've got to change the whole way that people transport around, both from a public transport point of view, we've got to move uh, quickly um, in terms of 
um, things like hydrogen in terms of uh, electric cars. But um, I suppose there are other things um, that are happening in terms of, you look at um, in Scotland, in terms of the amount of renewables, uh, in terms of uh, where that's got to over the past um, 10, 15 years in terms of both onshore and offshore renewables in terms of wind. There's there's a lot happening. Um, I have no doubt there's a lot more that we have to do. Um, and obviously one of the big things for us in the Cairngorms is land use and what we can do around land use and make sure that we um, do the right things in that. But I think it can only be done through a combination of many, many different things. And um, from my point of view, it's doing all I can within the Cairngorms and everyone there. Um, Scotland doing its part. The UK doing its part and then everyone doing their part, but um, I, I don't think it's going to be easy, but um, that's the path we're on and we've all got to do the right things. Um, on the point of nuclear or not, I'm not I'm not expert enough to be able to talk about that one way or other, I have to say. I'm simply going to kind of quote from the, the special report on 1.5 degrees, a lot of the academic work that's been done um, the reality with nuclear right now is that it's too expensive and that there are cheaper ways to do it. Uh, so the, the challenge, I would say, is in the electric grid, in transmission, and especially in changing the way that governments support their energy industries, because the level of subsidies in particular to the fossil fuel industry is just huge. And if one simply leveled the playing field between fossils and renewables, at this point in time, renewables would probably win out. Uh, and so there are certainly a lot of economic uh, ways to do it that hopefully can make it as just as possible. I would go back to what Lauren said. I mean, the, the just transition, that's really important because I think a lot of the opposition in places, say like the US or in the UK, to really leaving it in the ground or in Norway, which is so affected by it, is simply its economic considerations and its fear of uh, you know the workers rising up. I think that as scientists and as policymakers, we just need to do a better job of communicating the choices that we're making de facto, uh, particularly by continuing to rely on fossil fuels. So. A lot of levers to pull, though, and some of those have been pulled or at least pledged here at the COP. Uh, we'll see if they're actually put into effect in reality, because that's the big question. Yeah, I just, um, I'll just talk briefly on that. But um, I think, you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, actions not meeting words. And, you know, we see that within the, the MERS, with maxi maximizing economic recovery from the North Sea. How is that piece of legislation anywhere near compatible with a 1.5 degrees world. And so I guess where we come in is to try and leverage our connection to the outdoors to highlight these policy positions, these legislation positions that don't make any sense and try and use the, the, the medium of, out, of the outdoors to, to unpack that and, 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 and campaign for, for, that, um, for that change. And then also to make sure that we do that as as fastly and, uh, and as fairly as possible, because if not, like I say, communities that I grew up in will, will be left on its knees and uh, I won't stand for it and, and neither will my friends. As I mentioned earlier, Today, since I'm retired, uh, I'm a little bit more open to speak about things uh, in a more frank way, I would say. Uh, considering that the so-called renewables are not renewable, water power does a lot of damage downriver, talk to limnologists. Uh, the uh, solar panels, they add to the uh, social inequality worldwide. Uh, because you need the, the resources to build it. Uh, wind power, talk to the people which live close by. They don't like that very much. There is a huge opposition against that for good reasons. It's the noises, it's the bird life, it's this and that and that. Nobody wants to live beside a, a, a wind power. Nuclear, uh, it's easy to say and to debate that, but imagine you live in Europe and you think about the Fukushima in the middle of Europe. 
that's not 5,000 uh, miles down, uh, downwind until it, re it reaches the next population on the, on the uh, US American West Coast. It's in the middle. Most of the Europeans would not have a chance to talk about climate change anymore. That is the point with nuclear, nuclear power. But why does nobody consider a reduction in energy of 50%? Let's speak frankly. Go down 50% and we will try to solve the rest of the 50%, including uh, darkening down Chicago by 50%. And, and, and. That is the point to do. Else we are going to lose. There is really no way. Uh, think about 1.5. It is 50% more energy in the system than we have right now. Do you think? Do you really think that this is an easygoing world? This is an awful world and it's very, it will go very, very expensive and, and we will not talk about tiny little things like, like tourism here and there. This is already a huge challenge, 1.5. And going beyond is something which uh, will turn, turn around our entire world totally, either by design or by disaster. Either we manage to design it in a, in a way and that includes the reduction also in the 1.5 special report, they talk about reduction of energy, not just changing energy sources. Either we do that or the natural system we do it, will do it by itself, but without us. Be sure, if we, if we go beyond two, two degrees, there is no human beings anymore to, to negotiate about that. So let's be frank and, and, and talk about what the science tells. Do we have any questions online? No? Nope. In, in person, maybe? More remarks of questions? No? Well, thank you very much. Um, and we have our next event uh, at 4.15, which is when, uh, in uh, collaboration with the uh, Geneva Hub, which is about um, mountain communities if they can adapt about uh, with climate change. Thank you very much.